Now it'll be recorded. Dr. Fasano is doing well. Thank you. <laughs> Good. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna have you help me out today. In a couple of minutes, we're gonna be getting it kicked off, and I want you uh, to think of a question of the day for folks. So you have 120 seconds to think about it, and I'm gonna call on you, and you can drop it in the chat and announce it to the group. So the pressure. <laughs> you can do anything, Dr. P. I trust you. Good morning, everyone. It is uh, 8 a.m. Pacific Standard Time where I am. We're going to give it uh, just a couple more minutes until we get it kicked off. Um, Dr. P is going to be hitting us up in about 90 seconds with the question of the day as she's pondering what that might be. But uh, also, is there anybody new on the call today for the first time? Uh, Angie, I saw you pop on screen for just a second before you uh, went off screen. Did you want to say hello to the group? Or this could be the oh there she is sure hi i am angie everett i am with dallas animal services and i'm brand new to dallas animal services i've been here for i think seven months now i want to say and so i'm just happy to be here i was invited by my director to participate on the call and i said yeah for sure so thank you. Awesome. Angie, I have two <laughs> questions for you. One, yes. what do you currently do for DAS? And two, mm -hmm. what were you doing before you got to DAS? Okay, so I am an administrative specialist there by handling all of the finances and focusing more so on the grants part of it. Um, I, I enter the grants into the system, I accept the grants, and I have recently started uh, helping out in requesting the grant. So I'm still learning my role a little bit, but um, coming into my life really good with DAS. Prior to now, what a transition, I was with the Mayor City Council office. I was actually the assistant to one of our um, city councilmen. So <laughs> it, it's quite the transition still, you know, working with the, our constituents, but, you know, on a different um, side of it. Amazing. Well, thank you for bringing that wealth of government experience. And I feel like you could have been thank a radio you. host before, too. You have such great delivery. So we're going we're gonna to have to have you on one of these calls doing a presentation very soon, okay? No. Such okay, pleasure. I'll accept that. Awesome. Thank Thanks for you. Being here. Thank you. Thanks right. for the welcome. Of course. It is 8.02 Pacific Standard Time where I am on the West Coast, folks. Uh, good morning. My name is Bobby Mann. I'm the Maddie's Human Animal Support Services Pilot Director. Happy and honored to be co-hosting this with the Maddie's team and Mary Smith. I'm actually going to be kicking it over to Dr. Pisano to get us kicked off with the question of the day. Okay, people, um, I probably am the only person on, that I know um, who loves the holidays and I love everything about the holidays. And I hear so many people say, I'm stressed and this and that. I want everybody to just take a breather and concentrate on what you love. So the question is, what is your favorite part of the holidays? So mine is everything. I love everything about the holidays. <laughs> Food has ranked number one. Family is number two. <laughs> Dr. Carly, you put something so broad as traditions. Tell us what your, please unmute and tell us what some of those favorite traditions are. I wasn't the only one that wrote traditions, but thanks, Buffy. <laughs> I, but I know, but you're quick on the draw. So I know I can call on you and have you unmute well, in five seconds. No, so this is kind of a funny one. It's not my personal, well, my personal family tradition, but my brother-in-law's family tradition is to, for both Thanksgiving, every holiday, basically every ce celebration, is to make it's called some kind of hot it's basically like a spicy jello and it's it's really gross it's really horrible like it's like it's hot something I'll have to ask my husband he's got on a call but I'll type it in the chat later in case anyone else has heard of it he's from uh the Illinois area I think which isn't far from where I'm from I'm from Kentucky originally but it's really gross, but that was the first tradition I thought of because it makes us all laugh because we have to make it every single year for every holiday, even if he's not with us, just to show him that we appreciate his family's mm. traditions. <laughs> I love that. All right, Dr. P, keep this going for another minute or two. Uh, I will say, Angie, you did two things. 
you not only told us what you love about the holidays, you actually told us your love language, which is receiving gifts. So shout out for that. And if anybody is down, I just moved to Black Mountain, North Carolina recently, and I feel like I got vomited into a Hallmark movie. It is unbelievable. Like to the point, somebody said to me yesterday, you have to come to Holly Jolly. I'm like what the heck is Holly Jolly? It's a parade through town. And we just decorated the town square with scarecrows and, you know, ribbons and flowers and all of this. So it is such a beautiful place. If you need an upper, come to Black Mountain, North Carolina. I love it, Dr. P. All right, well, thank you all so much for sharing what your favorite part of the holiday is. And thank you, Dr. P, for supporting us and kicking this meeting off. Uh, and now I'm gonna kick it over to Mary Smith for some motivation on today's Monday. <laughs> Thanks, Bobby. Good morning, everybody. It's so wonderful to see you. So uh, just a couple of announcements to kick it off. This is the last week of October in case people weren't looking at the calendar. And it's a week that's filled with lots of good things for hopefully your heart, but definitely your brain. If you haven't had a chance to hear Alison Cardona's story of what, it, um, what her life has been like and what it's like in animal welfare, you should check it out. It's on the Maddie's Forum. It was our Canon Conversation in the month of October. And just as a um, preview, the Canon Conversation for November will be with our very own Dr. Michael Blackwell. And that's sure to be um, an enlightening, inspiring, and all around good feel. Also, our open adoption huddles are this week. Check it out tomorrow and Thursday. Those are um, opportunities for you to hear from the groups who have already opened up their adoption processes, who have taken that step, who have really um, moved us where we need to go, hear their stories, and maybe those will help inspire you to start doing things different in your own organization. I also wanna remind you that the ASPCA's Access to Care Survey is still open. Please um, fill it out if you can. I think it's, if you do it before November 5th, you'll be eligible for a raffle. And tomorrow, no, not to, Allison, is it tomorrow? The Marketing and Adoption Counseling uh, Workshop. 27th is uh, Wednesday. All right, thanks, Allison. That one really looks at the difference between marketing and the outcomes related to marketing and the outcomes related to adoption counseling. Now you may say to yourself, what the heck is she talking about? Okay, I have had two cups of coffee, so that could definitely put me into a different um, plane of existence. But those two things are very, very different. And I think the more that we can understand how they're different, it will help us do better about the work we do. All right, so I was really inspired that most of us said in the um, chat file that what we really loved about the holidays was spending time with friends and family, which means we like to spend time with people, which is kind of a bit at odds sometimes with the work that we do. But one of the things that we've learned from COVID is that we really can't separate what we do with the animals from what happens to people. And keeping people first and foremost, I think, is a really essential part of what we need to do going forward if we really are committed to changing the face of animal welfare. And so actually, as I just thought about that, maybe what I'm really talking about in changing the face of animal welfare is that the face becomes people, people with their pets instead of just always pets. Also, Friday, if you didn't get a chance to uh, be on the call on Friday. I would say some of the best five minutes you could listen to would be Kenny Lamberti talking about care and care circles and how you could join a larger group of advocates. And one of the things that Kenny reminded me of is he talked a lot about having your own version of agency and creating a movement inside of a movement. And so, um, People use that word agency all the time. And to be honest with you, I never really understood what they were talking about. So I had to look it up. So yes, it's true that agency refers to an organization. Actually, as an animal welfare person, 
I always thought of agencies in terms of, you know, an animal control agency or animal services agency, sort of a different term for organization. But actually, agency means something different. It also means our ability to act independently based on our own free choices. Now, those are pretty loaded words, and I'm going to actually spend part of this week pondering the meaning of those words and how they manifest themselves in my own life. And as I think about them in my room, surrounded by dinosaurs who probably didn't have very much agency, and as a result, only exist on my walls, and, but I'm still here. And so as I ponder that term and think about our ability to adjust, to adapt, to change, I encourage all of us to embrace that part. You've all said what you love about the holidays, family and friends. What a great place to practice those things. I'm out, Bobby. Thank you. Thanks, Mary Smith. And as you were talking about family and community, my mom texted me and it really just made my morning so much better. She was just checking on me through these storms. But um, I know we talk a lot about community and we, we talk a lot about togetherness and I know we take it with the good and the bad. I did want to share some unfortunate news that I heard over the weekend of someone who has uh, become sort of like my big brother, brother and mentor, Brian Doherty. Many of you know him from San Diego Humane Society. Uh, unfortunately, was in a very, very bad cycling accident and ended up in the hospital over the weekend. Punctured lung, broken uh, ribs. Uh, he is okay. His wife texted me. He's going to be out of the hospital today. Uh, but I'm hoping out of these, you know, close to 100 people, someone could uh, put together one of those cool little group e-cards because I'm not tech savvy enough to do it. Um, put it in the chat and maybe all of us can sign something nice for him so we can really uh, push forward as a community and, and hope he gets well soon. So uh, that's my one ask for the day. Uh, but we do also have a very, very, very exciting day. But before we get to that, I also want to open up the call for national updates. So if you have any national updates from an organization or you want to just share a cool win from your local organization, uh, now's the time to speak up. Thank you for allowing me to um, practice holding space in, in quietness. So that was awesome. So let's go ahead and get it kicked off into our presentations. We have two amazing, amazing presentations today. Uh, something that I'm very excited about. One, I got to meet Keith Tolagai a few weeks ago uh, when Best Friends hooked me up with him uh, to talk about his uh, work that he's doing with the Navajo Nations. But I think it's just so amazing that in less than a year, Keith has really invested so much time and energy just building relationships and building a foundation of trust. So Keith, I'm gonna to toss it over to you to get your presentation kicked off. And if you need anything from me, um, like I said, don't be shy just to call on me during the call. Sorry, okay, thank you, thank you. I'm gonna share my screen. So um, I'm Keith, like um, Bobby indicated, <laughs> and um, I work with Best Friends uh, Animal Society. I started uh, February 1st, uh, 2021, and um, started my role then. Um, I think prior to that, I used to be, um, well, I, I've always been an animal welfare advocate uh, since I was a little kid. I've always had animals. I've always had dogs. I used to have like probably 10 dogs and several cats while growing up on the reservation. Anyway, um, and then um, I worked in education actually, mostly uh, I, I wasn't a teacher, but I worked on the outside helping kids graduate from high school and then uh, uh, assisting them navigating through the college uh, access pro, um, process. And so that's what I did for a lot of my um, years. And when this position uh, came, um, was announced, I decided to apply for it because I thought that, you know, hey, 
I like animals. Um, I've been away from the reservation for about 30 years and then moved back in 2016. So I'm, it, it, a lot has changed when I came back to the reservation. Um, I think um, I'm still adjusting, even though it's been five years. Uh, being away from from home, I guess you'd say, is, is is it's been different being out there, and then coming back to where I grew up, and um, it's been just a little bit of an adjustment. Anyway, so the Navajo Nation is about twenty seven thousand square miles. It encompasses um, the majority of the land is in in Arizona, right here. Then there's that sliver of um, in Utah, and then this is in New Mexico. Um, it's larger than 10 states. Um, and then there's three other satellite, um, um, I guess, outside of the reservation, which is here, which is Pine Hill, Rayma area, Alamo, which is near uh, Socorro, New Mexico, and then Tohaji Lake, which is over on here, uh, which is close to Albuquerque. And so it's a huge, huge um, piece piece of land, I guess you'd say. And, um, and he, on here, there's 110 communities, 110 chapters. And this is me, this, is, this red dot is where I'm at. And as you can see, you know, this whole area is where, um, where all the animals are. <laughs> and um, on the reservation, there's only four, right now, three operating um, animal control um, locations, which is here in Medi Farms, which is close to me, um, Fort Defiance and Shiprock, and then uh, Tuba City way over here on the west side. Um, it, it, they, had, they, 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 they don't have an animal control officer anymore, so it's been kind of in, inoperative for uh, several months now. And Kayanta here has just started uh, another, um, they, they, they found an animal control officer here, but it's, she's not affiliated with the Navajo Nation. So she's with, a, I think, a nonprofit group. Anyway, so, and then there's only nine animal control officers for this whole piece of land right here. And so, as you can imagine, you know, a lot of people, they, 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 when they do go out, it, 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 they go, sometimes they have to drive for hours before they can get to the location when they get a call. Uh, the same with me, you know, I have to, it's an hour and a half to get to Fort Defiance to collect animals if I'm going to do a transport. It's about an hour maybe to get to many farms to get um, animals to get, to, you know, to, to transport. And so that's what, that's who I, I, that's where I work and I'm enjoying it for now. So, <laughs> well, I do enjoy it actually. So. so that's the Navajo Nation and the animal control um, welfare. So the issue I think that I see is that we have an overpopulation of animals. Uh, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of puppies, a lot of kittens. Um, a lot of them are not vaccinated. Um, of course, a lot of them are not spayed or neutered. And so that produces kittens and pup puppies. And we have dogs that become strays. Um, we have puppies almost every week, um, the animal control collects about 50, sometimes 100 animals, you know, for, for, for them to, um, and then they start reaching out to the different rescues to come and see if they can, if they're able to take, and some do. Um, and then the, the, the animals have a limited time to be in the, in the shelters. They have 72 hours from the day they're, they're taken in, and if they're not claimed or if nobody, if no rescues come, then they're put down, they're euthanized. And so a lot of the rescues, you know, sometimes they contact me and say, hey, can you meet me at this location? There's um, this many animals, there's this many dogs, there's this many puppies, there's many kittens that, that we need to take out from the shelter. So I either go to many farms and uh, collect and pull and, or Fort Defiance and, and do the same. Um, sometimes at both, and so I'll have like maybe sometimes 60 animals in, in, in the van and, and then transport to a location where I meet um, uh, um, a rescue. And one of the rescues that I've been, that, that we've, I've kind of been working with quite a bit is Soul Dog. Uh, she's from Denver. Um, 
And then there's other locations also, of course, you know, Mountain Girl from Flagstaff and Good, Good, um, Good Dog Rescue from St. John's, all these different areas that, that come and, and have been assisting us, Puppy Love from Cape Creek um, and Phoenix, um, Casa Grande, uh, Valley Humane Society. Those are some of the areas that I've been really uh, working with to, to, to transport those animals, these puppies, so that they, they're not killed. And, you know, it's not that, um, I think, you know, just recently, um, recent being like uh, during the spring, something really tra tragic happened. Um, a, a pack of dogs killed a little girl. And since then, it just seems like um, there was a lot of sensationalism on, on, on the, the plight of our, our here on the reservation where, um, you know, animals just running amok, I guess. But I think um, there are strays, but I think one of the things is that some of those strays are, are um, owned by people. Their pets, and they just we don't some some areas they're not contained they're not um, in a fenced in area, and I think that's just um, something that that that's been just um, a lot of the people don't 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 feel that um, an animal should be pinned up even though you know sometimes it, it might cause trouble so it's just a lot of um, awareness and education that needs to happen I think so that's the issue. Um, overpopulation, unspayed and unneutered um, animals, which reduces, of course, um, this perpetual cycle of um, an overpopulation of animals on the reservation. And so what the solution that we, we've implemented is, of course, you know, the, the immediate life-saving transports, which, which, which I've been doing, which I've, um, um, I, I'm told that since I started, we, we probably uh, took about 800 and, and, and over 800, 800, <laughs> 800 um, animals to different locations. And then directly sometimes uh, when we can, we take them to best friends and then there to about, so altogether 1600 animals that we've saved. Um, Cause I do have a volunteer that, that works with me here in Pinion, his name is Dave. And he's been, um, he's been, you know, he's been a, a, a saving animals um, since he's been living on the reservation. And so what, you know, we, we, that's what we do. We, we, like I said, we, I think that's gonna be uh, something that's gonna continue for a little while until we have uh, a solid ground on what we need to, uh, until we, we get that um, outcome of Not uh, the outcome of not having an overpopulation of animals, and you know immediately we, we really need to do the life-saving transport. And then we do have uh, spay, neuter, and vaccination clinics, as you can see here. People do, you know, it's not like people are not don't care about their animals, their pets. They do. And here we have in Kayanta a spay and uh, neuter clinic, uh, low cost, and so we have people coming in and lining up to get their animals spayed or neutered or even vaccinated. And a lot of times some of these, um, these, these, these vehicles will contain up to, you know, maybe 10 animals. And so they're, they're, they're coming in and, and, and they're, they're looking for these places, these areas. Um, and we have them almost every weekend. We have people coming in, all these rescues coming in to have the spay and neuter uh, a vaccination clinic here. This is Medi Farms um, the, at the animal shelter. They had a free rabies. Um, a free rabies um, vaccination clinic so people came to get their pets um, vaccinated. Over here, like I said, is the in, in Cayenta is the um, spay neuter and vaccination clinic which we had um, during the summer. So, you know, I guess we, we are trying, we, we're, we're doing what we can to, to make sure that um, we end that um, the overpopulation, we get the, the, the animals vaccinated. We, we want to stop the overpopulation and, and, and making efforts to do so. I think in doing that uh, all along, we're, we're trying to bring awareness um, to um, the communities so that, um, and these show that, that, that these pictures show that people, like I said, do, do care for their animals. They want, um, what's best um, 
and 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 I think um, just 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 re um, re educating. You don't want to use that word, but really re educating. I think the communities on how best to uh, what what needs to be done. Um, because I, I forgot to mention, you know, even in, in my culture, um, we, we talk about the four-legged, you know, they're, they're our brothers and sisters, and that these animals are sacred, and that they were created in a sacred manner. That's one of the things that I always remember uh, my, 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 grand, my grandmother and my, even my dad talking about how, like, you know, when we say a dog, in our language, we say, but they have a sacred name. We call them dadesle which means the protector of the doorway. And then they also have another name called that meaning that they're, they're earth listeners and, and that they start to, my, my dad always says that, you know, you already know when somebody's coming and, and if the dog starts to get agitated or it starts to wag its, its tail, you know, whoever is coming, they already know whether that person is a good person. They already know whether that person is coming with bad, bad thoughts or whatever, depending on whether they bark or whether they start to wag their tail. And, and so, you know, I, I think just, just re-educating our, our people on, on, on those sacred stories, on those stories of, of, of how they are sacred, um, that they, they and, and, and what needs to be done to, to, be, um, to protect them, to, to keep them healthy. And, 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 and one, of the, one of that is, is, is being just um, keeping, you know, keeping them from overpopulating the, the reservation. Hey, so can I ask you a quick question um, just on yeah. that thought? Thank you so much. And I, I love that you're just sharing sort of um, all, all of this sort of internal conversation. Um, so there's a lot of organizations on this call that don't have the opportunity to have someone like you who is, you know, from the nation or has current relationships. For someone that's maybe bordering a different nation, wh who's the first person do you think they should reach out to if they're trying to sort of build relationships? I think um, we, we, the, the, the animal control um, is, is, is part of the, um, the part of uh, wildlife and fish and wildlife. It's funny because, you know, and then, and then there's a section there, which is the animal control. And I think um, I, for me, I think reaching out to the animal control officers would be the best, the best, um, the best place because they are the ones I think um, who are in the throes of, of, of collecting these animals. And, and you know, I, I talk with them, I talk with Ginger and Tamara, they're the, the, the animal control officers um, at many farms and for defiance. And then, you know, they, they have this stressful job of trying to um, keep the animals alive. You know, they don't want to euthanize, but sometimes it, it, it just, when, when there's no rescues coming in or when, there's, when they have no place to go, to turn to, then they have to do that that job, which is which, which they don't like. You know, um, it's something that I think. So for me, I would I would say I think reaching out to them or me, <laughs> reaching out to reaching out to to them would be um, I think the first the, you know asking what can they what what can be done to help, what can be done to assist. Um, it, it's not like I'm trying to put them. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I don't mind being the go-between uh, and, 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 and doing what we can to, to assist, I guess, in getting these animals. That, that was the perfect answer I was looking for, Keith. Thank you so much for being our ambassador. And back to your presentation. Sorry for interrupting. Okay. So I think, it's like I said, just, just so that we can create a, a stronger um, community awareness and advocacy from our, our, you know, from our communities. And I think one of the things I, I talked with um, Olivia, who heads the uh, Navajo Nation puppy adoption program, and a new she has they have a new um, nonprofit called Resolution. Um, her and I we talk and we were talking about how we you know as a nation we really need to take that responsibility in in, in making sure that we we start our, on being independent you know and 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 have a functioning. Um, animal control or animal welfare um, program on the reservation so that even though we have a partnership with all these different uh, rescues, um, how, how cool would it be to, to, 
to have something independent, uh, independently run on, on the reservation so that, um, you know, even though there's gonna be that partnership that, that we can do our own thing on the reservations, what we, I think are striving for um, her and I. I, and, I and love it. it. Yeah. Um, and <laughs> I, then Keith. Like, yeah, that, that's your, what we wanna do. Per your request, you had told me to just give you a time check. So we have about five or six more minutes. So if there's uh, specific okay. things that you wanted to, talk about also there's a ton of questions in the chat for you so i definitely want to get to those as well okay and then i think just um challenges that we have programs i think we, we all need to be in agreement we all need to see um on, be on one page and then fear of res dog diseases i think sometimes we have we end up with puppies that have parvo or distemper or whatever and when that happens i think a lot of programs just don't really want to uh, take in those puppies because they feel that all the puppies coming in from the reservation are disease ridden or whatever. And I think that's one of the things that, that, that I see. Um, and I know that, you know, rescues are at or over capacity. Uh, and then just the lack of resources. We have one vet who works for the whole Navajo nation and then and not enough manpower for the animal control um, shelters. And that's it. Questions? Amazing, Keith. So first question I see here um, is from Cheyenne that asked if you have any sort of sample MOUs or contracts between animal services in any of the nations or territories. Um, one of, I, that, that's, um, I, I have not seen anything yet from the animal control. Um, it would be fall under the animal control and um, they usually, but from what I noticed, they usually will sign an MOU with the um, outside parties. That's what I noticed. But I, I think uh, we, the NAF Foundation doesn't have uh, an MOU, but I have to check on that to see if I'm speaking the truth. <laughs> so. Perfect. And then Keith, could you remind us uh, how many people live on the nation currently? Uh, Stacy had that question. We have about probably, there's three, I'm gonna say probably 100, 175,000, maybe uh, 180,000 people living on the reservation right now. Yeah. Amazing. And I will echo what Laura and Jess are both saying that your voice is so calming and soothing, brother. And what I'm gonna ask for you is we do have one more presentation but we typically end the call at the top of the hour. I hope that you can hang on and maybe even okay. send us into our week and give us some words of wisdom before we close out. Okay. Does that sound good to you? Sounds good. Such an honor to have you here. Uh, let's see. And oh, yes, one more, one more question actually from Cameron. Uh, Cameron, do you want to unmute and ask your question? I was just curious, um, even though there's a low human population, do you have any idea how many animals are free roaming or on the, the nation? And then also, um, is the veterinarian that you mentioned employed by the Navajo Nation, or is this a private veterinarian who's just um, made it their their job to, to okay. offer veterinary services? So um, Dr. Kelly Abshabaya is her name. She actually is employed by the Navajo Nation and her primary office is in um, Sebonito, which is close to Windrock. And there are like um, clinics in Shiprock and Chinle. And uh, so she'll go to, every week she'll go to those different locations for just so that she does what she needs to do. And then um, on some of those days, there's, there's because she, you know, she, she, she does like course, she, she, she does the, everything in some sense. And so on certain days, they'll still schedule at a different community and then she'll go there to do what they need to do or they'll schedule uh, and within the month, maybe a week of whatever needs to be done at a different locations and she'll go toward the reservation to do that. We do have other um, private, um, I guess, um, privately owned vets, which is in Tuba City. Um, Dr. Holgate is there. She. Uh, runs a, a vet there too, a vet clinic there. And then we have a mobile clinic. Her name is uh, Dr. Adrian Ruby. She is in Delcon and she'll do a mobile. She'll go around uh, the different communities also to offer uh, vet services. Um, but the one by, uh, employed by uh, the Nafa Nation is Dr. Abshah Bahia. And I actually don't, even though it's been reported that there's 250,000 free roaming animals I think to me that was just a really sensationalism 
Um, I would say probably maybe a quarter of that. <laughs> maybe, uh, but I know that there's, there's, you know, every community will have like, right now we've been trying to get like um, three dogs at, on, at the parking lot, the local grocery store that I've been trying to, but they're, they're pretty skittish. And so uh, I, we just, we just feed them for now, so. <laughs> awesome, thank you so much, Keith. Thank you, Cameron, for your question. Like I said, I hope you can stick around and, and hang out I with will. us. It's such an honor having you here. And uh, I'm sure there's gonna be a lot of people reaching out with additional questions. So if you don't mind also just putting your email into the chat, uh, hopefully this is our, our first conversation as you part of this community, not our last. So grateful for you, sir. Thank you. Awesome. All right. Well, let's move on to presentation number two. Oftentimes people ask me what I love about the work I do the most. And without a blink of an eye, I can say two things. One, getting to hang out with all of you, uh, often Mondays and Fridays and being in large communities, what makes my heart happy. But two, it's meeting people that are coming to this work from different backgrounds and getting to learn about just the way that we're shifting our community. And I think uh, Alessandra, who is here as a new executive director of the Arizona Animal Welfare League since I believe March of last year, uh, has been such a pleasure to get to know. I think for her work that she did for the last decade at the ACLU of Arizona, just really working on equity work and supporting marginalized communities, it really helped me understand and put uh, a lot of reflection on the work that we're doing in animal welfare and what change management looks like. So as an animal welfare organization, as Mary said, that's trying to move to people and pets and really be more equitable. It was so amazing to hear from Alessandra and just how much time, energy, and just support she had to put into even shifting an organization like the ACLU. So Alessandra, over to you and thank you so much for being here. Hi everyone, thank you so much. It's, a, it's an honor to be here and it's an honor to, to be here with Keith and follow Keith. He's an amazing, amazing leader in the animal welfare space and we are um, honored and blessed to have him here in Arizona. So I've been learning a lot from him. So thank you, Keith. Um, all right, I'm gonna share my screen here. Um, let's see, one second, let's see how uh, I'm gonna, there we go. Okay, hopefully everyone can see that. So, um, okay, great. Um, all right, so I wanna just, thanks for that introduction, Bobby. So I wanna thank, Thank you. I want to thank Maddie's fund and Mary and Keith. Um, I want to talk a little bit about, as you know, as, as Bobby mentioned, like how I've approached my equity work throughout my career um, in, in the nonprofit space. And, and really, my what has driven me to this work is the you know, that drive to kind of build, as, as Keith was mentioning, is like how do we build the capacity of communities of color? Um, so that they can help build their own agency, right? So that they can act independently and address the needs in their community. So, but I think I just want to be completely honest. Like I had, I, and when I was preparing this presentation, I had to be honest with myself. You know, I come to this work uh, as a white presenting Latina who for 15 years, you know, I've been the director of a civil rights organization. And then most recently I've been able to transition into this animal welfare space. Um, in, in March, I became the president and CEO here of the Anim Arizona Animal Welfare League. And I, I recognize that really does put me in this position of power and privilege to be able to have these conversations and to lead these conversations about how to make these change. But I am in absolutely no way an expert on this topic. And so I'm here today just to share, share some reflections and lessons learned. So I wanted to kind of lead um, with the... Um, I thought it was appropriate to lead with two quotes, quotes from noted Black authors and scholars, James Baldwin and Ibrahim Kendi, both of whom are anti-racist historians and scholars. So not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it is faced. This is from author James Baldwin. And Ibrahim Kendi says, there's no other option than creating the impossible. You know, despite the harsh realities that people of color face every day, over-policing, over-incarceration, the economic and health inequities, I find myself kind of going back to these quotes because they give me a tremendous amount of hope for our collective futures. And so my experience over the past 20 years advocating for civil rights has shown me that there are opportunities for change that present themselves at all of our organizations. 
And when those opportunities really do present themselves to change the status quo, you've got to jump on them. Sometimes these are really tight, discrete windows to secure transformative changes, and oftentimes they won't, they won't come back. And these, you know, these, these protests, these push for racial justice that we've been seeing over the past five years are that opportunity. So, you know, I think before we do that, though, I think we have to face the facts that, you know, both of these scholars talk a lot about confession, acceptance, vulnerability, willingness, the recognition to lean into difficult conversations. And I think that's what I'm going to talk a lot about today is like how that how you can actually do that in in your organizations. So, but before I do that, I wanna talk a little bit about racial justice. What does it mean? So racial justice is the fair treatment of people of all races. It's about recognizing the need to change systems that create racial inequities and challenging racist systems, biases, and beliefs. It's also about recognizing what the Management Training Center calls choice points, right? Those are choice points or these opportunities for leaders to choose different options or different paths that can actually create more equitable outcomes for people in our organization. So what are some of these unjust systems we're referring to? Bobby asked me to talk a little bit about my work at the ACLU and then kind of compare it to some of the work that I'm doing right now at AAWL. So, you know, in at the ACLU, some, many, many people within that organization thought that the justice system itself, the court system, was an unjust system. You need resources to hire a lawyer. You need resources to pay fees to file your own legal papers. Then you need to be able to understand how to write legal briefs. This is a strategy, a system that benefits people who are affluent and educated. One of the things that I did while I was there was implement what we call like a community-based lawyering system where rethinking how we file our cases. And so recruiting plaintiffs and asking them and engaging them in decision-making and, um, and decision-making that is traditionally reserved for the attorneys. And so that's like rethinking how we had done something very similar or had what, one way that we've done something and completely rethinking it and choosing an alternate path. That's an example of a choice point. In the animal welfare space, a lot of us are having conversations about access to vet care. That is the veterinary programs are programming is a choice point, right? These are all choice points, the cost, the hours of service, staffing, who, who do we apply for grants for? These are all different choice points that could lead to different outcomes for the communities that we serve. So Bobby, I wanted to just do a quick um, audience participation question or a poll. I wanted to see if um, that way, I just wanted to kind of get a pulse check from everyone. I know that, that you know, tackling equity and inclusion work at organizations can be daunting and it requires change. So I'm wondering if um, we could show that poll. Yeah, of course, Al I'm, I'm sure Allison can prompt that for us. Thank you, Allison. There we go. Thank you. Multiple choice here. There's no wrong answer. <laughs> we'll wait a few minutes. Looks like we have about 40% of participants that have taken the poll. So probably another 15 seconds or so, and okay. we should be ready to share that for you. Oh, interesting. This is great. Okay. So it looks like we're pretty similar here across the board. About 40% of people are really uncertainty is, is one of the, our own barriers here and concerns about how to tackle diversity, lack of awareness, lack of support from leadership. I'm glad to see that's not at the top of the list, which is wonderful to hear. Don't know enough about the topic. Absolutely expected. And that is, um, and I think that's absolutely, it's, it's a process. And as Bobby said in the beginning, it's a process that takes many, many years. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that. But before I do, let's kind of dig into um, what some of these definitions mean. So when, when I was at my previous employer, um, we talked about it, equity, diversity, inclusion, as what we called EDIP, right? So it's equity, diversity, inclusion, and belonging. As Mary was saying at the beginning here, when we talk about equity, what we mean by that is, like, what are the structural barriers that prevent access and agency? to the mix, like what are the barriers that prevent people from making their own independent choices? That's what we mean when we talk about equity. Diversity is, um, and so equity, for example, the barriers are those, some of those that I, that I gave, the example of a barrier of the veterinary care system, right? That's one example of a barrier. 
diversity is, is basically who's in the mix. How many staff people of color do you have your organizations? How many people identify as LGBTQ or as individuals living with a disability? That's the, the sort of the data pieces of, of who is part of your organization. Inclusion, how are they in the mix? Do you, does the staff, particularly the staff of color, have decision-making power? Are they included in policy decisions, for example? You know, one of the things that we did at the ACLU was we recruited staff members and volunteers who were formerly incar incarcerated and then asked them for feedback and input on what bills we should be pushing and advocating for at the legislature. Rather than us making those decisions, we, we turned to those experts to actually get input from them. At AEWL, where I am now, we created a strategic planning task force and I included both staff Staff, non senior and senior staff as part of that strategic planning task force, different functional areas, staff of color. We were very deliberate about, about who we wanted to be part of that conversation. And so now those staff members, many you know, non senior staff, are now at the table and deciding what our future goals should be. So that's an example of a change in a practice that leads to greater inclusion. Belonging. This is like how people feel when they're at work, right? Do they feel respected? Do they feel accepted, valued, or included and encouraged? Um, you know, this, this might not sound important, but I one simple, simple change that we made at my prior, um, you know, at the ACLU was we started, not that I, I love Panera, my children love Panera, but my staff came to me and said, Alessandra, we're done with Panera. Let's start, you know, let's start recruiting and engaging local community-based caterers for our staff gatherings, right? Um, and so we started hiring caterers who were came from the transgender organizations, from DV organizations, who had as catering their own revenue generating catering businesses. And so it helped to create more of a sense of belonging. So I'm gonna, the next thing I wanted to talk a little and bit about- I'll, Alessandra, I'll just, yeah. uh, since I know you're sharing your screen, I, I'm happy to monitor the chat with you. So I just wanted to make sure you could uh, get a feel for some folks' comments. So yeah. Jesse noted that uh, they mentioned uncertainty because they hey. mostly are. Jesse, are you there? Do you want to speak up? Uh, they can't hear me. Oh, 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 like, okay, I'll move um, that. Sure. I mentioned uncertainty, and really, um, my primary focus there was the idea of starting to address the issues, but potentially doing more harm than good. Um, in the way that we speak about things or the space that we um, that we don't create a safe space. And I feel like the question of safe for who has come up before also. So just noting noting those things. Right. And that's and that's an excellent point. And I think that the way that and that's that's a reality. And I think for me, the way that I have tackled that is to you've got to start, you know, from the beginning in ensuring that your, you know, your employee handbook, for example, um, explicitly addresses some of these concerns, right? And I think that I have, you know, traditionally kind of gone back to that where we started out, for example, um, right now where I am currently, right, is adding gender identity and sexual orientation to the list of categories that are protected. Um, beginning to um, create, for example, a process where it is clear, you know, like a clear process where if people feel like they are, they don't feel safe, they know who to turn to. Um, talking a little bit about, I'll talk a little bit about creating those safe spaces um, because it's not just simply as the policy change, right? If you're going to make those policy changes, you have to create the time, you have to create those, those, uh, those community circles where people do feel safe sharing, and that is what takes some time. I do think that it's important to start with, with values. Um, and, you know, many, many organizations, you know, it's what they do is they'll end up changing those policies and then not focusing on the values. And values are, when we talk about values, let me, let me uh, talk a little bit here about my first, my first sort of takeaway. Values are, are really at the heart of our work and the values are, knowing each other's values helps to create that, that trust and that vulnerability. And when you identify values as a group, when you start the process of identifying values as a group, rather than going straight to the policies and doing it first as a management team, then maybe as managers and directors, it helps you create that alignment. And then um, it helps you get to know each other. For, for us at the ACLU, we spent four months talking about values. 
and um, and really everyone sharing what values were important to them and then sharing what their definition, like how those values, what the definitions of those values were. Because when we talk about respect and collaboration or accountability, that might mean something to me, but it might mean something very, very different to, um, you know, Jamie or Laura or Bobby. And so creating that space to have those conversations. And that means, um, you know, community circles, questions, prompts. I mean, that for, for me, that was a big deal where I came from because it was an organization that was full of lawyers. Um, and that wasn't something that they were used to, right? Um, and so, you know, setting aside time and, and those meetings to like share pictures of you as a kid and talk about what are some of those memorable moments as a child. Um, and, and, you know, again, I, I recognize it, it does take time, um, but I think the more that you do it and you do it at different levels of the organization, um, eventually you will get there. When I say it takes time, I'm talking about, you know, two, three, four, five, ten 10 years. It took me 10 years at the, or at, at the ACLU. Um, let's talk a little bit. I'm going to skip this next audience participation question because I, I know there's probably going to be a lot of uh, questions. So my, the second takeaway that I wanted to talk about is um, decide how you're going to show up for each other, right? When you agree in those values, then come up with written agreements about how you're gonna uphold those values. And I think this is very, very important that everyone understands that because a lot of times for us in our organization, right, is um, you know, collaboration and respect is a value. And so, but I think for us is, is you know, we were, we were really explicit, I'm having this conversation right now as a management team, is like, what do we mean by collaboration? That means using language, for example, that says, you know, what do you think about? Help me understand X. Are there aspects of the situation that I'm not aware of? I mean, these are conversations. I mean, I know, I know it sounds really, really you know, prescriptive, but for us as a, as a management team, it has helped us really understand the tools and get a better, more familiarity with the tools that I think are really necessary to then have those diff difficult conversations that, um, you know, that kind of manifests when your values are clashing. So um, that's, Third takeaway that I wanted to talk about is, is thinking beyond those, those one-time training sessions and really commit to significant investments and in building internal capacity. And for us, it was staff training both at the senior level and at the non-senior level. And when I talk about training, I'm not just talking about training in like equity and inclusion. I'm talking about training on how to, training your non-senior staff on how to manage up, training your non-senior staff on how to manage projects. This is like when we talk about sort of building greater equity in an organization, it is providing those same types of resources to everyone across the board in an organization, adding a training budget if you can, if you have the resources. And so a lot of times we have these, um, you know, it's not just about, yes, you've got to learn about the history and the context of what structural racism mean. Everybody, we've got to come to shared agreement about what, what these these topics mean, but it also means skills building. And it means teaching your teams and, and building that internal capacity on how to have difficult conversations, right? Because I think that um, it empowers the non-senior staff and it also, it creates that culture where um, you em embrace conflict, right? Rather than um, shying away from it, because I do think that ultimately it makes you um, a much stronger, better organization. Um, I thought, so one final takeaway that I wanted to talk a little bit about, and I just wanted to share a resource here. Um, much of the work that I have um, relied on at the ACLU is an organization called Equity in the Center. And, you know, certainly each organization's journey is unique, but research from Equity in the, in the Center suggests that organizations undergo these like different stages of change. And I wanna talk very, very briefly about the different stages. So when you're, and we hear this all the time, right? It's an organization that's awake, right? Awake means an organization that has increased representation um, of people from different backgrounds. So at, at the ACLU, what we did was we did a salary survey, an equity survey, we restructured our leadership team. We added specific job requirements, like asking that people have demonstrated commitment to diversity as part of one of their job requirements. An organization Equity in the Center describes as woke is an organization that has actually achieved greater inclusion and that actually has changed its, its policies and practices. Adopting a new decision-making framework, for example, is a substantive change in policy that we made that, that really went, um, that had a huge impact, right? Is that 
being honest, like incorporating and getting input from more people rather than just me as the CEO uh, making those decisions is, 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 it doesn't necessarily mean that I'm not gonna be making any decision, but it means when I am making decisions, everyone there's clarity and transparency around how we're making decisions. That is a change in practice and behavior that creates equity and that also has a significant impact. But as I mentioned, you know, policy changes, adopting a policy against workplace harassment, discrimination, retaliation, having a clear process for filing grievances, that does go a long way for at least in writing, creating that, um, sending a message that you're serious about creating welcoming, inclusive, and safe spaces. Um, creating a new equity inclusion task force of the staff is another example. And then an organization that is um, has sort of reached this um, level of, of, of equity, right? Is, is um, this is the aspirational goal? It's 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 an organization has to be constantly working at creating or greater equity internally, and so constantly applying the race equity lens to examine how your organizations and programs operate. So my final takeaway here is. It's a marathon, it's not a sprint, you know, stay the course, pace yourselves, I think commit to humility, commit that you don't have all the answers, that we all have gaps and opportunities to develop. I mean, this is, I find myself doing that a lot where I am right now is saying, listen, um, I don't, I, I am, you know, we're in the process of like really looking at all of our legal forms, for example, and here we are, if we're creating, adding gender identity as one of our protected categories, well, what do we need to do in order to really create ensure that our, our legal forms are also um, welcoming and inclusive. And so that is also a completely new process for me. So admit that you um, are still learning and, and you know, recruit external, you know, um, external consultants, other organizations. You know, one of the things we're doing right now is we're recruiting um, a community health center that we're working with on an access to vet care project, just did a video where they invited our local equity, you know, um, equality group from Arizona to do a video on pronouns, invite them to speak at your staff meetings, um, co-sponsor events with them. But again, this takes time. And so I think in order to really ensure the sustainability of your work, you do have to commit not just for you know, budgetary lines to support this work, but um, just to commit to, to making these changes long-term. So I know that was a lot to cover, Bobby. And so um, I wanted to just um, turn it over to any other questions or see if there are other questions that came up here. Yeah, thank you so much, Alessandra. Uh, before we open it up to questions, I know that Mary was talking about an amazing candid conversation from Alison Cardona that everyone should watch. But Alison, I wanted you to unmute and give us your thoughts on this presentation, please. Oh, thank you so much. And um, Alessandra, it's wonderful to hear you and thank you for the work that you're doing. Thank you. um, and yeah, I, I would say that the marathon piece, you know, but I think the self-awareness piece, and I love that you talked about humility, I don't have all the answers. Um, I would also just say, listen to BIPOC people, you know, and like a safe space and maybe not call them out in a group, but have like one-on-one -on -one conversations. Um, and I think as folks who are in positions of leadership at animal welfare, um, you know, I saw you talking there about intent, but I think it, there can be a tendency to be really defensive when things are brought up. Um, and really putting that aside um, and listening, just really listening and maybe not responding um, and reflecting and doing the work uh, ourselves. But don't be daunted. It definitely is, we're all in this together. And I think um, there's just so many opportunities here. And I really appreciate hearing from you today. Thank you so much, Allison. Yeah, that's, a, that's um, you know, kind of a, a great comment and insight there about not kind of calling out um, BIPOC folks in your communities. One of the things that I've started doing is exit interviews, and um, they have been extremely helpful. They're exit interviews just for me. They're offered as an option, and every person, um, you know, you start to see patterns. Um, and, and you're able to document these things and then you're able to have conversations with your teams about like, like let's, let's step back and look at why these things are, why, why this is happening, right? Thank you. Keith, I'm gonna have, ask you to get ready to unmute, but Dr. Carly, I wanna to come to you really quick because I know you had a question about just this fire hydrant of information that's been coming through the last year. Yeah, I really appreciate um, this presentation because you actually, so my, my comment was that um, we, there's been a great overload of information um, on this subject matter and within our industry, 
Um, but it it's, can be overwhelming to really break it down to the granular pieces of where do we go from here? What do we need to do? And for me as a <clears throat> life-saving researcher for Best Friends Animal Society, I'm trying to figure out what pieces to focus on the most, but your presentation was wonderful because you actually did do that. You broke that down very nicely. Um, but if you have anything else to add, or if anybody wants to add anything about suggestions for, um, you know, breaking down this really important uh, discussion and topic in general that we're, we're all talking about, we're all learning more and more about, um, I, I welcome any feedback. But thank you for that presentation. Thank you so much. I'm going to give a plug out to best friends and data. I got to say, for me, the last 10 years, last 15 years, I mean, data Data is a great way to have these conversations about race, to be racially explicit, but you lead with data. And so for me, like leading with my, you know, you lead with the heart, which is we talk about the values and you come up with your values and your shared agreements. But then when you are presenting data and doing that analysis, the data speaks for itself. There are disparities all across the board. Where are our doctors coming from? Who are we serving? Is our, where are we located? Is it in the, you know, Air, the Arizona Animal Welfare League is in the highest poverty zip code in this, in this in the city, 70% of the people who live here are monolingual Spanish speakers. Why is it that they're not in our system, right? Why is it we're not serving them? And so, I mean, that's that's a strategy that has worked for me. I'm I'm in Arizona, you know, Keith and I are in Arizona. So we're, a lot of times we're, you know, we're trying to get a lot of buy-in from that. And so the data, and you all have a, a lot of data, right? Um, speaks for itself. So that's one strategy. Thank you so much, Alessandra. Thank you, Dr. Carly. Thank you, Allison uh, and Keith. I wanna, and also thank you to Maddie Smith for holding this space for all of us and allowing us to have these conversations. So Keith, please send us off into our week and uh, give us some positive vibes, sir. Um, what did I say? <laughs> Anything you want, the floor is yours. Okay. Well, um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna talk about um, what my grandmother said to me when I was like about six years old or seven years old. Um, we were herding sheep. And, um, and then she says to me, Sitsui, and that means grandson. And, um, and when your grandmother says Sitsui to you, you know, your, your ears prick up and then, and then you, you listen. Even though I was set, probably about six years old, really. Uh, and then she told me, um, in life, when you're Always stay in the middle, she said. Always stay in the middle. That's where balance is. That's where hajon is. That hajon in Napa means um, beauty. It means balance. It means um, <clears throat> it means harmony. It means everything good. And she said, you always stay in the middle. You should never be too proud and you should never be too sad. Always stay in the middle. And I wish for that for everybody, hajon. So. Thank you, Keith. Everybody have a wonderful, blessed day. Good to see you all. Hope to see you back next week. Cheers. Thank you.